right, uh, welcome. Welcome back. It's been a wonderful morning and lunch so far. I hope everybody's enjoying it. It's my real uh, pleasure and treat to introduce uh, this group. So I, in, in January of 2000, I left 17 years in the industry, mostly research, uh, some EMP, and started here at UT. And in August of 2000, I was on an airplane to Brazil with, uh, with Bill Fisher, and it was my Brazilian exposure trip. And on the way down, Bill said, uh, Tinker, I got to tell you about a guy named Jack Jackson. <laughs> and I thought, okay. And from that point, well, for many years before that, for, for personally for me from that point forward, uh, the groundwork began uh, to what became the Jackson School and, and where we are today and hopefully where we'll be headed. And a lot of people had a lot of vision. They put a, very much time into the formation of what this school is. And I think it's important for our faculty that are able to be here, uh, research scientists that are able to be here, and the students who could break away from classes to hear some of that history a little bit and what it really takes to put together a new college at a major, major research university. It's non-trivial. I'll probably hear a few good stories too. So Larry asked me to introduce the panel briefly and I will do that. Uh, Larry Faulkner is president emeritus of the University of Texas and was president when the school formed and is really in many ways a chief architect of what actually happened. Uh, Peter Fawn is president emeritus of the University of Texas. Uh, he actually served, I believe, as the only president twice uh, and still comes to work. Well, I was sitting at the table this morning and, and, and I think Bill Fisher came to work about 7 a.m. And, and Peter was there before him and said, where were you this morning, Fish? So, uh, you know, that's how things still go. Um, and was a very important part. Uh, Bill Fisher, of course, uh, you all know, the inaugural dean of the school and former director of the Bureau, chairman of the department, and many other roles that he's played, and a good friend to Jack. Jim Langham is, is a close friend to all of ours, Jack's close friend and financial advisor throughout all this, so he actually helped architect it from the Jackson side. The Jackson Five, uh, Jim actually was on the other side, but Marianne Rankin was the dean of Co College of Natural Sciences at the time, and so Jack, it was his term. He kind of dubbed us his Jackson Five, and I guess that made me Michael, because I think Michael was the youngest, or maybe he was the sixth. But anyway, we thought it would be fun to get the group together again, who are all still actively engaged in what goes on here. Larry Faulkner has graciously agreed to uh, moderate, if that's possible, <laughs> this this panel, and we'll just talk a little bit. and. If you have some questions, write them down, but uh, the conversation will be led by uh, in the capable hands of Larry Faulkner, the President of Maris UT. So Larry, it's all yours. Thank you, Scott. Um, this group uh, has really been asked to uh, sort of reminisce uh, about uh, the things that led up to the creation of the Jackson School and, uh, and the events that uh, that ultimately uh, resulted in its uh, formula, formation and establishment uh, and its gaining momentum uh, as a Jefferson School. There we go. That better? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, and um, so we'll, we'll be very informal up here, and I think if, a little bit later if you have questions, you have to try to address them. I think we're going to start with. Pete Fawn, uh, then we'll go to Bill Fisher, and then after that, it's free for all. Oh, Pete. I first uh, met Jack when he was on the Geology Foundation Advisory Council, but I didn't know him as well as Bill Fisher knew him. Uh, in 1997, when I came back in as interim president, and we were recruiting Larry Faulkner, uh, I went to see Bill. When you, write, when you want to raise big gifts, there's, there's three elements. One, you have to identify a donor who has the capacity to give a big gift. And second, you have to have intelligence as to what his or her interests are. And third, you have to cultivate them. Sometimes it takes years. Bill Fisher had already done all that with Jack. Uh, so 
he took me up to see Jack, and I had a, a rend an architect's rendering of an addition to the geology building that had been kicking around for a while. Never, we were never able to fund it. And I remember we went into Jack's office, and after the usual stories about the oil business in the old days, uh, I unrolled this rendering and told Jack that we would like his help in putting an addition on the geology building, and the price tag was $18 million. And I asked him for it, and he said, oh, he said, I'm going to have to talk to Katie about this. He said, you know, Katie thinks we're going to be out on the street. And uh, we talked a little bit more, and then we went to lunch at uh, Jason's Deli. And uh, that was the end of that trip. But uh, Jack decided he would build the addition on the geology building. And I will leave my remarks there. I'm trying to get there. We go. All right. Finally there. Well, uh, look, uh, yes, a long story back with Jack. He did come on our advisory council in 1975. I didn't know him all that well until, uh, uh, until I became director of the foundation in 84. And he used to come by my office before every one of the advisory council meetings. He wanted to talk for about an hour and a half. Jack was a big talker, and he loved to tell stories. And uh, you'd meet him, and he'd say, tell me something. And before you could say a word, he was talking. So that's <laughs> the way he went. But one day in there, he, I guess he thought I was getting a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit uh, glazed over with, uh, with his uh, stories. And uh, he finally said, uh, Bill, he said, that, that advisory council down yonder, uh, most of those guys on there got some money. But you need to know some of us got real money. And, uh, and I really got my eyes perked, uh, head perked up a little bit. And, so on. and then a little bit later on, he, uh, by early 1990s, he had actually showed me how uh, the value of his uh, of his. Uh, 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 holdings and, uh, and, and indicated his attempt that he was going to do something. He said, but I can always change my mind, you must understand. And, but then at that point we knew that he had, uh, he, he was, uh, what his uh, inclinations were, and we were going to try to follow up with it. Uh, so uh, uh, that's where uh, we uh, I kept going and asked him, well, maybe you'd like to do a little bit of something here before you, uh, before you leave us and so on. And, oh, no, no. I, I, when I'm dead, you can have it, but just don't bother me about it anymore. So, but he did start fumbling about where he's going to put his uh, put his stuff, you know, and, uh, and all of that. So that's when we got the idea of the uh, building, and maybe we could get him into it. And that's what Pete was referring to just now. We were up there at several several points, and he finally agreed to do that. Now that brings me to Prelude to make the main point. So we uh, he he agreed, agreed to give that give 15 million. Uh, and uh, he said, you know, you tell it, it was 18, Bill. It was 18, whatever. Uh, but he's going to give it in, in, in thirds, you know, uh, a third here and a third there. And it had to be built in two years, but what, we didn't get the last third. And so we were, and Larry said, by God, we'll get it built in two years. Actually, we were in there just a bit under two years. So that's what a, a strong president does. But uh, in April, 19, uh, uh, April 17th, uh, 2001, that's where I wanted to start my 84 days. Uh, we were about 50 yards north of here with a pile of sand under a tent having a groundbreaking for, the, for that building and so on. Cold as the devil that day in April, for, at least for Austin it was. And uh, afterwards we uh, finished that, got a little shuttle bus to ride over to the Littlefield House. Larry was uh, hosting a, a luncheon in Jack's honor. And old Jack uh, leaned over to me, and we were sitting together on the bus, and he said, Bill, what's next? And boy, that was a question I was waiting for. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, uh, Jack, uh, uh, Pete Flan and I have been talking since 1984 about uh, uh, how we, what, it would be a real big advantage we could, if we could bring together all the geoscience entities here at UT. We looked at it, looked at it strong, the differences in, in cultures, difference in budgets and all kinds of things just made it uh, kind of administratively uh, 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 not very meaningful. But I said, what you're getting ready to do and what I think you could do here and so on, uh, we could uh, maybe do that by creating something called the Jackson School of Geoscience. And uh, he said, give me a paper on it. So we had the lunch, flew back on Larry's plane up to Dallas, and at 4 o'clock I got a call for him. He said, when are you going to get up here with that paper? I knew he was ready to go then. There's no question about it. And so uh, I said, I'll be up there Monday. I sent him a two-pager. I hadn't even talked to Larry Faulkner about 
uh, anything about this school business, but, uh, but, I, but I thought we might work it anyway. Uh, and uh, uh, Jack, uh, uh, he, 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 really, he really liked uh, He looked at the paper and he said, well, I want to think about it. So we talked back and forth for, uh, for uh, a few days there, or several weeks, I guess. And, uh, and then uh, he, I was back up there and he said, well, I, I, I think I'd like to do this, but, uh, but uh, I tell you what, how much is it going to cost? And Jack was he'd always straight up got it with what things he's going to do. And I said, well, I don't know. I have to get back to, uh, and he said, would, would uh, Larry Faulkner create this thing? And I said, well, I'll go back and talk to him. I did. We met over there. I think Peter was there, Marianne and Larry and maybe Johnny Ray. I'm not sure. Uh, and we agreed upon a price tag of $50 million. That was Larry's uh, term. We didn't agree upon it. Larry said it at $50 million. And uh, so I went back up with Jack the next day and, uh, and said, well, uh, uh, the president said he would, uh, would create the school and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the price tag was $50, 50 million. Uh, let me think about that. And so uh, another couple of weeks uh, transpired. And uh, uh, then he, uh, I was back up there and he said, okay, I'm going to do this, 25, 25 million. That's all you're going to get. And you'll get that five, five million a year. Okay. I said, well, I'll have to take it back down to the president. And we went down and we met over yonder. I forgot what it was. He, I think in, uh, pretty early on in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, down in May, pretty, pretty deeply. And uh, I said, well, Jack's all keen on this thing, but it's 25 million, five million a year. We sat there and talked about it. Uh, and then finally Larry turned around and said, okay, we got a Jackson school. And so I took off up to up to, uh, to uh, uh, with, with Jack, and, uh, and he, was, uh, he was really very excited. So uh, we put together a document and, uh, for him to sign uh, that would contractually do this, and, and we traveled up there on June 14th, uh, come up on the president's plane, Larry and Peter and, and Marianne and, uh, and uh, Johnny Ray, and we sat there and... Uh, and went over all the charts, talked a little bit, went over the charter, Jack went through it line by line, and uh, he finally said, well, I'm ready to sign. And about that time, five pencils were shoved right in front of him. You know, we, 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 were, we were pen in hand, and he, and he signed it. Uh, Barry Ann Rankin had bought up a couple uh, bottles of champagne, so we... Bubbly Coke. Huh? Bubbly Coke. <laughs> Jack, lo Jack loved a good drink, and it was... Uh, it, it wasn't even... It, after breakfast, so we had the campaign, had a little toasting there. And then we had to go with what mandatory with Jack was to, and, and, and I almost come an addict of a chili, but he'd like to go to Jason Deli and, and order a great big old bowl of chili. So sure enough, that's where we went there, the whole darn trip down there and had that big bowl of chili. Pete's had everybody up here had a bowl of chili with him. He also liked the soft serve ice cream. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that up there. <laughs> So I remember coming back, and we were, we were riding in the car, and, and, and Larry Faulkner said, well, by golly, that's the first $25 million bowl of chili I've ever had. So, uh, <laughs> so we were off and running. Now, we're getting pretty close here on this thing. We, uh, we uh, uh, met, uh, and that was pretty well wrapped up. He had signed it. July 10th, uh, uh, Larry Faulkner had us uh, uh, over, to, uh, over to the uh, uh, Clark Library, his office, had a luncheon for Jack. And Jack was, or Larry was to announce that the, on his recommendation, the, uh, the Board of Regents had agreed to, to accept uh, Mr. Jackson's generous gift, and it would create a Jackson School of Geoscience. That was just 84 days in the making from the what's next to, uh, to it was it. And, uh, and we had a school and very substantially endowed in 48 days, or 84 days. That's right. <laughs> you will so verify talk, that. Let's talk a little about uh, how it felt on the other side. Jim, Jim uh, Langham here was uh, with us at pretty much every meeting. Uh, and, and, uh, and was uh, advising Jack. Uh, Jim was Jack's accountant for a long time. And uh, I think uh, experienced this from the other side. Why don't you turn your mic green and tell us what you remember. He was also the executor of the estate. Well, I'd, I'd, say, uh, I'd say the following three or four things. One, I think that, uh, you know, prior to Katie's death in 2001, Jack always believed that she 
he would die and she would be left. <clears throat> I knew that was not going to be the case. He was way tougher than she was, even though he was five or six years older. He just really wasn't going to do anything until what was going to happen with Katie. When Katie died in March of 2001. It was an entirely different situation. Jack then decided that, you know, let's see what we can do with this money I've got. And, and I think that from that time on, I think that the, uh, the, the stage was set for something like this. Uh, what I would say to all of you, uh, we want to talk about how you get to this stage and what you do, how you pull this off. You're looking at the four guys that pulled it off. You want to thank somebody for your funding, your education, all the stuff that you have today. These are the guys. <laughs> now, Jack would tell you that the money you got to have the engine, you got to have the driver, you got to have all the rest of that stuff. And he, he would say that, you know, money in some ways is a curse. But you have to have a plan, which these guys had. You have to be able to put it together, which they did. You have to have the talent. And I think the rest of it, you find what we find here today, 10 years is not very long. Not very long in geological sense. Not very long in school sense. It goes quickly. It's amazing 10 years. Just like that. We won't be here. Well, at least some of us won't. I don't plan to be one of them that's not here, but <laughs> 10 years from now, it'd be interesting to see how many of us are still here. <laughs> Scott is younger than the rest of us, and so he's... <laughs> that's right. But, but I, I, I would say on Jack's behalf, I think he would be immensely proud of where it is. I think I think everybody's done a great job. I think Sharon's been super as dean. I think the whole thing is, is really run out. But again, 10 years is amazing how quickly it goes. Let's go. Scott, Scott was uh, also in, uh, Scott had come into the, to the BEG uh, sort of in this Right, at, we were probably already active in all of this uh, when you came into it, but you came into the conversations, and uh, um, I think you might have some recollections you'd like to share too. So why don't you tell us what you? I'd like to make just one comment before Scott gets started. Fifty years ago, I was director of the Bureau of Economic Geology. I had Scott's job, and the president of the university was Norm Hackerman. And I was trying to do something about the salaries in the Bureau. And I went to see Norm, and I said, you're treating research scientists like second-class citizens. And he said, you are second-class citizens. <laughs> <clears throat> and it became clear to me then that uh, that was the big impediment to the merging or the integration of the three units that now constitute the Jackson School, that uh, until we had a, a mechanism like the Jackson School to integrate those units, and in my opinion, that's the great achievement of the Jackson School under Sharon, that she was able to put these three units together, that that's, that's going to be what makes the school in the future. Jack was a, we talked a lot about the money, Jack was a geologist. And he went off to the war and, and came back and he looked at bauxite in the war as, as I remember the story and, and then that put some ideas in his head about Wise County and finding gas in the Lowe's and the conglomerates up there in the bend. And, and he was a smart guy. Um, and, and so these words that we're following today are partly Jack's words about the vision he had for science and integration and what he wanted to invest in. And I think that's a real important piece um, it, it's, he's not just a, someone who gave money or invested money. He actually had a vision for how the, the world will play out. He also had a very big um, passion for underprivileged, undereducated uh, under um, Hispanic uh, kids and families and wanted to make sure that we invested our efforts and resources in that. 
to bring education along because he said, if you don't do that, I'll never forget this. He lectured me a lot. I was, I, I was, I'm 56 now, but I was about 41 or two when this all started. You've so always I, been so easy to lecture to. I know, you're good at it too. And, <laughs> so, so, you know, he, 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 he counseled us that way to make sure to do that. But one of the stories I found this was the funniest thing was when we went down. Um, one of the other groups was, was uh, a group that Jack and Katie invested in was the hospital system. And, uh, and, and Doug Bre uh, Breckenridge is a friend, a family friend from Trinity University days, but Doug was big on that side of the house over there. And they, and they had put a lot of money into libraries and hospitals and things. But the, the hospital system was having this huge banquet dinner one night to celebrate some things and, and the Jacksons and really doing what we were doing, kind of work, you know, working to, uh, to get some, 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 some gifts from the Jackson, from Jack Jackson. And, and at, at the honorary table, the whole table was UT. Jack decided to invite all of us to dinner. I think it was down in San Antonio. And, and, and we all walked in the room, and all the hospital people saw UT walk in the door, and they thought, we lost, you know. <laughs> and so whoever put that together was one of the most clever things. And I think Jack had the most fun with that dinner because he was just watching people go back and forth. But uh, I think the, the horns were all up, and they were quietly under the table. But we knew the direction it was going at that point, or at least I felt so. Say a little bit about his early history, Scott. I think we need to go back a little ways with Jack. talk about you want to talk about the geology part? I want to talk about Dean know what me okay, well let me let me talk a little bit about that I would like to talk about who Jack was um, um, he was uh, Jack was raised by uh, a single mom um, she uh, uh, was uh, uh, I think a hard worker and uh, involved Social service. Public work. She was in charge of the Dallas Public Works. Right. And she, uh, but he, in his middle years, uh, in his um, kind of high adolescent years and early adult years, he actually was taken under the wing of his uncle over in Shreveport, uh, which is my hometown, by the way. And uh, uh, he, uh, his uncle ran a, uh, oil and gas related business and Jack actually went through pretty much every job, he did every job. Every job. Uh, and at a critical stage I think he was working in Longview or someplace around there and uh, his uncle fired him. Well he got word that he had to pick up his last check. Put your, put your mic on. Charles Martin. There you go. He, he got word that he was to come to the office and pick up his last check. Well he was steamed. So he comes to the office and he says, you know, I've done every job you got. I've been in the pits. I've cleaned out the garbage cans. I've done all this stuff. And he said, why would you fire me? He said, well, he said, we're, we're firing you so you can go to school and get an education. <laughs> Jack, Jack said to me that his uncle told him that uh, you've learned everything you can learn around here. Uh, go get some we education. Need to, we need to force you to. And that's when he came down to UT, but uh, he had a rocky start, uh, and basically, I think, flunked out. Yeah, uh, it was petroleum that's where I put in. Yeah. <laughs> it was in petroleum engineering. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, he was going to have to leave. He was brought into the office of the, a legendary dean of men, uh, a guy named uh, Novotny. Arno Novotny. Shorty. Shorty, he was uh, nicknamed, and, uh, but uh, Nowatney took Jack under his wing and and uh, said, "Look, you're just not academically well enough prepared to cope with this place. Uh, go to Temple Junior College uh, up the road here and um, enroll there. Uh, spend some time strengthening your your fundamental subjects Basic and student. Uh, student student. Uh, and then we'll come back." You do well enough, we'll take you back. And um, Jack, uh, all his life, remembered that experience with the Watney. Uh, he believed that it was a, uh, a signal intervention, an intervention that was really aimed at his best interest and uh, 
his best development, and it really paid off. It also paid off because while he was in Temple, that's when he met Katie. That's it. And uh, their lifelong romance uh, came out of that came out of that Temple experience. But he came back to UT, came into geology, uh, uh, and went on to a, a fabulously successful career in geology. But uh, Jim also points out that he made about half his money in real estate. He made as much money in real estate business. I, I want to make one other comment I didn't make a while ago. Uh, you know, as I look back at all this that's happened, uh, really over uh, as to the UT part of it, I think it's been more like 15 years than 10 years that it has been. But the, the point where the thing changed, I believe, was when he changed it after Katie died. They'd had their wills for 25 years. They were A.B. wills. If he died, she inherited his half. If he died, went the other way. No trust. They weren't worrying about taxes because they always had planned to. The money was to go into the Katie Foundation, which was a private foundation, to be managed by the community's foundation, which is a public foundation. The tax rules are a lot better if you do it that way. Also, you have a public foundation managing it, and so you're sure that the assets are going to be properly handled. Jack, the income, corp, the income from the corpus was always going to come to Texas. Eighty percent of it was going to come to Texas. Five percent was going to Texas Lutheran, five percent to the Presbyterian Hospital, and ten percent to the Texas Exus Association. When he, when these guys got through with him. <laughs> okay. He changes his will, and rather than the corpus being managed by the Communities Foundation, it's now being managed by the Foundation. Let me tell you, that is a game changer. Getting the income stream is one thing. That's great. But having the corpus, that's, that's the way it ended up. And it ended up where you didn't get 80%, you got Cut out the ex students association, which means all you guys have got to pay your dues, and get the papers. Initially, the plan was he was going to, they were going to take some of the money and pay for all the periodicals that came out of the student association. He didn't like that plan. He thought that the ex students should pay, pay part of the cost. He believes everybody ought to pay some cost. And that's a, probably a good concept. That's kind of what's wrong with the country today. We've got not enough people paying. Got too many people holding their hands out, but not enough pay. But Jack, he 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 when he changed it, he made that change. That, in my opinion, was the game changer. Because then the assets were coming to Austin. And, and uh, let me follow up on that. I think uh, one thing you may be wondering about is uh, the difference between. Uh, Greg Finvis's comment that the assets are now worth $300 million and the fact that he made a $25 million commitment. Uh, we actually knew from, from a lot of conversations with Jack that the way he wanted to handle his estate was that a large fraction in the end would come to UT. Uh, it wasn't particularly... He called it the remnant of his estate. <laughs> The residual of his residual. Well, he, he told me it was a sizable percentage, and I knew it was, I knew it was high. Um, although it wasn't all that specifically dedicated to, uh, to geological sciences at that time. Um, well, the, the corpus wasn't going to come to Texas. Right. The but corpus was going to stay in Dallas at the Communities Foundation. But, but the change was that the corpus then came to Texas. Right. That, that was a big change. Well, he, uh, but there were several stages where there was, there were, I think, some, we, you know, we took different steps. Um, we were about to close the billion dollar campaign. Um, we weren't really ready to close the campaign, but we were crossing the billion dollar mark. By the way, that was back in the days where a billion dollars was a lot of money. <laughs> but uh, but we, uh, we were about to cross the line, and I actually wanted Jack to be the line crosser. And so we were roughly, I've forgotten what it was, maybe 30 or $40 million short. Um, at the time I talked to him about it, when I 
said, Jack, if you just tell us that you're going to do this estate commitment, um, even if you don't tell us um, the amount, it just has to be enough to cross that line. Uh, I'd like to announce you and Katie as the, as the guys, who, the folks who put us over the line. And uh, he liked that idea. He did. He liked it. And uh, so we did go with that. And then uh, on the day of the announcement, um, where we did announce the gift, um, uh, which was Independ Texas Independence Day on March 2nd, 2002, um, he announced that he was committing the largest portion of his estate, is what I say right here. Um, and um, at, the, at the time of that announcement, we estimated it was worth about $150 billion. And of course, he said, I'm worth more than that, but he let them. He let them use 150. He didn't like it. But. Well, it was, actually, it's what one between the letter over there will say between 150 and 200, but uh, it wound up being a bit, quite a bit more than that. Well, let's not forget the royalty income. Well, we're including that. Well, that was that was something that the system, UT system wanted to take away from us. That's well, right. Jack, that, that was the other thing. Jack didn't want the he didn't want the boys out in West Texas managing his royalty. He wanted the he wanted the councils, that group, and the foundation people here to, to manage it and all. And that was a change that we had to get approved, and, and uh, they, did, they did approve that. And, and I think that's something that uh, is important. I think it's important for the school to keep up with it, and not send it out to West Texas. Well, that approval went all the way to the Board of Regents. Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, and we that called was, in a number of friends to try to influence that decision. On the board and off the board. And off the board, yeah. <laughs> right. um, I think we ought to say something about Jack's war service and his relationship with George Mitchell and Wise County. Please. Well, who knows more about it? I, I don't know as much about it as some of the other people here. Well, I can talk about his war record right after the... Japanese at Bomb Pearl Harbor, where right, Jack signed up for the U.S. Navy, and he was down in New Orleans being processed, and in the process of, uh, uh, of that, uh, he got jerked out of line and said, you're under special presidential orders. And he said, what the world does that mean? And, uh, and it was, that was a provision that President Roosevelt had signed that anybody had any kind of unique skills could just automatically be uh, conscripted into this uh, particular activity. Jack knew how to run a core drill, okay? And uh, we were desperately in, in need for, uh, for uh, aluminum. Bauxite was what we had in Bauxite, Arkansas. And uh, so they sent Jack over yonder uh, to work with USGS and the people up at the University of uh, Missouri at Rolla to uh, the old engineering mine school up there. And they, they spent the, he spent the whole war over there on a rig, uh, uh, drilling and mapping out those Nephilim cyanide knobs. The important thing about those doing it, they, they mapped this as a, there was a USGS professional paper that came out of it. And what Jack was finding when he take these old weathered knobs and they weathered the box, that would wash off down off of, off of, the, uh, off of, the, off of the highs, kind of the old buried hills idea. And, uh, and the reservoir rock would be, uh, or the bauxite would be down in the, in the lows. When he went up to Wise County, uh, he, he, he took that same idea with him. Uh, there's an interesting point there. There was a, what Colonel Jimmy Hughes in, uh, in Dallas had a ranch out there and uh, in Wise County. 20,000 acres. Uh, 20, acres and, he, he, and Jimmy thought he had a sea of oil underneath it. So he sent Jack out there to map it. And uh, Jack uh, uh, then uh, 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 went to work out there. So I guess it was a consultant for uh, Mr. Hughes or maybe he was getting a, an override or whatever. But, uh, but uh, he started mapping that, and he applied the concept of the, set of the buried hills and the, the Nephilim Sinai to these hills up in the, in the, in the, where the Boonsville was sweeping off and under. And he drilled off structure. And drilling off structure in the 50s, any of you guys have been around a while and so on, that wasn't, that wasn't very common, you know. You, and, and so, but he did. And he made a discovery up yonder, and the main discovery was, uh, was use uh, number one, 1958, still producing. The best well that was ever found in Wise County. And so if you, we have a well down here on the corner called Santa Rita Number 1. That's to the university. But to the Jackson School, use number one is, is, our, is our piece up there. So that's where, uh, where the royalties. Now, the Mitchell came in there. He, they discovered that gas. 
gas was selling for about nickel in those days, if you had a pipeline to get it out. If you didn't have a pipeline to get it out, you wouldn't get anything out of it. And, uh, and so uh, they worked forever up yonder trying to uh, see if they could get Lone Star. What was it Lone Star? Well, what, what, what happened? Ahead, you know that. Pick it up. Anyway. Lone Star had control of all of North Central Texas, and, and their price they were paying was five, six cents an MCA. But he, he had gotten in contact with George Mitchell and his brother, and, and uh, Jack's partner at that time was Elliston Miles, who was a drilling contractor. And so they, they put this, gather, this group together, and they had these investors in Houston. R.E. Bob Smith was their big investor. And uh, so they had a meeting, and Jack uh, told them, said, we've got this property out here we want to drill. We're going to need some money to drill it. And, and, uh, and so um, Bob Smith said, okay, I'm going to put up the money to drill these wells, which he did. And he, and, he, and he said, but he said, as soon as you know that this is not going to be a success, you come tell me. He said, uh, Bob, he said, I assure you, you'll be the first person that I tell as soon as I know that it's not going to be a success. They drilled, I think, 97 wells, and all of the wells were producers. Jack would say they were all successful. I would say probably 85 of them were economically successful. They all made, they all made gas. What happened was they then went to Chicago and daily and they made a deal, they built a pipeline out of North Central Texas. It took them quite a while to do this. It was five or six, seven years to get this thing done. And then, but, but the Chicago crowd paid them $2.32 an MC. So, you know, even though it took a long time, I, I, I made this comment earlier in some of this stuff. I, you know, people think, well, Jack went out there and drilled a few four wells and he was rich. No like that. It was a long time. It took a long time. And once they got the pipeline going and they were delivering the gas, it didn't take too long after that. But it was six or seven years to do all this. Explain to these people the difference between a working interest and a royalty interest. You want me to do that? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> okay. Royalty interest is, is the base mineral interest that most landowners in Texas owned at the turn of the century. Working interest is the people who pay for the, the development of the well. You know, a lot of, in a lot of these deals that Jack was in, they also had a bunch of overrides. The overrides were, were what uh, people got for generally put the deal together. In, in Jack's case, what happened was when they put that deal together, there were four owners. There was Le, uh, Elson Miles, John Jackson, and the two Mitchell brothers owned it 25% apiece. The problem was none of those guys had any money. They had to get some partners in there. And so that's when they went and got the gas house gang that was in Houston, what they called them. Those guys put up the money. And, and what happened was Ari Bob Smith has, was the guy who was very successful finding the out in Snyder. I mean, he, he's the guy that really developed a lot of that properties out there. And he was quite, we quite wealthy. And he, he convinced, he told Jack and Elliston, he said, guys, he said, you know, the truth is you got this 25% interest here, but you can't pay to develop the wells. He said, what you need to do is sell me the working interest, and I'll give you back an override. And both Elliston and Jack's interest were overrides out of that working interest. Ari Bob Smith owned, bought them out. He owned the 50% that the two uh, Jackson partners owned. Mitchell bunch owned the other 50 percent, but those were about 80 percent leases, and, and the royalties and the overrides out on those leases there was 20 percent out in, in, in that in that manner, but but it was very very successful once once they got that back. Did I answer the question? The Geology Foundation now has the royalty interest, right? Yeah, we have the overrides and manager. If you've been listening carefully, I know you have. It, it takes a hell of a lot to put together a school. I mean, you've heard from regents to presidents to financial to a lot of things you haven't heard about that went on behind the scenes, and there were different school models, et cetera. And, and I think the point I always come back to in my head and with Jack was he was very big on leveraging. So every time we spend $50,000, $40,000, there's a million dollars of endowment sitting behind that. 40,000 bucks doesn't sound like much to us these days, or a million dollars. And Don Blankenship's talk this morning impressed me the most. 
uh, of all, they're all very impressive. I don't mean the most, but the most in this leveraging sense of Don thanked Jack more than once. But what he really has done is taken an investment here, a small investment here, relatively, and turned it into a global thing with all sorts of different players investing and growing into a major international, <laughs> you know, transworldly enterprise. And that's the kind of thing Jack Jackson, I believe, would, would love to see done very much in terms when he says, I'm investing my money. That's exactly what he meant by that. Don't take 50 grand and spend it. Take 50 grand and turn it into something really big. Um, when he sold, Bill tells his story a lot better than I do. We're running out of time. But when Jack's wife was going to leave him, as he says, for the shoe salesman because he was never home, he decided to sell it out and sold it to George Mitchell. And uh, Mary Lou is going to be our keynoter here in the last session. She runs the Mitchell Foundation. So there's some interesting links that go on, and they continue to go on in this world um, that, that uh, you know, very much, I think, are, are, are something that we all got to continue to pay tribute to. But I, I sure learned a lot under just watching the tutelage of the guys up here at this table, and I know we all have. So personally, I thank you all very much. All right. Um, but we're gonna, I'm going to close this up, but, um, and we'll take maybe one or two questions. Do we have time for that? Yeah, one. But I don't want to, uh, I don't want to end this without giving, using Jack's words on what he wanted. Um, the gift was uh, in his words, and we worked on this carefully, but it's short. It says it's to create perpetual revenue to support teaching and research in geology, geophysics, energy, mineral, and water resources, as well as the broad areas of earth sciences, including the environment. That's the statement of what the Jackson Endowment is there to support. Uh, and he added this in his own personal comments on the day of his announcement. This, these are his words. Uh, the resources of the earth have been important to me and to what Katie and I have been able to achieve continued study and understanding of geology and the resources and environment of the earth will be important to the university and the citizens of Texas in the future. Jack was a very future-oriented guy. He, he could see into the future, I think, uh, and that's why he did so well in real estate and other ventures. But uh, he believed in what this institution and what education do for people. Uh, he had experienced it himself. He believed that uh, what he had been able to achieve was deeply rooted in what this university was able to give to him. Uh, and he wanted uh, the benefits of this place, especially in uh, geology, geophysics, earth sciences, uh, to be at a very high level, uh, at a world class level. Jack was also a competitive guy. Uh, he was an athlete and uh, was seriously competitive, but he really wanted this place to reach for the top. Uh, one time when Bill was dean, we used to use the phrase that the endowment should not be used for daily bread. And um, I still believe that's a, that's a, a kind of phrase that ought to be borne in mind as the folks in school. He wanted it to be investment money. He wanted it to build into uh, something that could bring uh, benefits back. And uh, that's the kind of guy he was. Uh, I think in the 30 minutes we've had to talk about him, uh, that's what we can do. There's a lot more out there to him. And uh, the people at this table didn't know it. Well, like I say, these are the four guys you need to thank. They're the ones that do it. All right, thank you.